All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. All right. So we are part three in our study of Exodus 34, 6. And, you know, it's this beautiful verse that comes right as, uh, you know, they had come out of the wilderness and Moses was on the mountain and they, um, he was getting the Ten Commandments and, and the, um, and getting instructions on the tabernacle and everybody down below was wondering where he was. And they built the golden calf and this anger God. And, and Moses came down after God said, look at these people. Um, and he broke the 10 commandments and God was ready to consume them in his anger. And, um, and Moses intercedes, you know, for the people saying, okay, God, like they messed up, but let's not do this. Um, don't count. Don't, don't them in your anger um and so God relents and and kind of Moses is figuring out this relationship with God like it's always an ongoing and developing relationship like we look at these key characters in the Bible like Abraham Moses and, and we look at them and sometimes we see like their their final finished product right and, and we forget that all of these individuals like are in this constant growth in their relationship with God Right. And Moses is growing in his understanding of God. And and so kind of in the stage, he says, like, OK, God, reveal yourself to me. Show yourself like help me to know you a bit more. And so he takes him up on the mountain as they're about to redo the Ten Commandments and so on. And and that's where we get our theme verse for today for, for this series where it was Exodus 34, um, six, which says, then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. And, and we're taking each one of these attributes and, and digesting them and kind of expanding on them in order for us to also know like who, who God is. Because just like Moses, you know, wanted to know who God is, all of us need to know who God is. And, and, and we are in a constant state of growth in our understanding of who he is. And, and so we really want to look at, you know, these words, but in the context of scripture, right? To not come up with our own definition of, well, this is what I think gracious is. And this is what I think a picture of compassion is. Like God revealed himself to us in scripture. So we need to dig into scripture in order to understand, right? And we covered compassion and we covered, you know, graciousness. And, and to look at graciousness, you know, you know, grace is this idea uh, or, or used to describe when a gift is given towards somebody because that individual has found favor in, in the sight of somebody else, right? And we looked at a couple different examples of that. Um, we looked at Esther, how she went into the king's court, which was illegal and punishable death, but the king found her to be delightful and showed favor to her. And, and pardoned her from death and, and held out a scepter. Same, we saw these same elements in the story of Jacob and Esau, and as well as you know God caring for the Israelites, even though he was punishing them in the, in the wilderness for 40 years, he was still caring for them at the same time. Why? Because he delighted in them, right? And he wanted to give them a gracious gift. So he supported them. So that's compassion and that's graciousness. And now we're going to, unpack um slow to anger right which is an interesting one but i got plenty of opening questions to, oh, okay. to, to pose to the group that's plenty of questions for today all right what are telling signs that you notice that you may have noticed on different people that show you that they're angry oh boy <laughs> <laughs> Body body somebody, how do you know like they're angry? What are the telling signs? Body language. Okay, so body language. Give me like some give, people, give me body get, language. Some like, people get really red in the face. Okay, when they're angry. okay red they're in like, the face. Good. Uh, well, um, kind of uh, their eyebrows will get together. Their eyes will squint a little bit, like they're starting to get angry. Mm -hmm. um, Body tense. Tense body, all right. Fists. They clench fists. Okay. Uh, uh. 
or they lose their filter altogether and they just spew out whatever. Okay. Yeah, they cross their arms in front of them like, uh, all right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You can see fire in people's eyes sometimes too. Okay, so so their their eyes. Loud voice. Okay, loud voice. Okay, good. So there's a lot of different ways to describe, like, or to pick up that somebody's angry. Okay, next question. What are the different ways, like, you would articulate that somebody's angry without actually using the word angry? Uncomfortable. Okay. Uh, are you saying uncomfortable about how you feel in response to them? Because I'm, I, I'm <laughs> no. terrified, like, like they, like how you describe to somebody that somebody's angry without using the word angry. What are different words that like synonyms to anger? Irritated. Okay. Frustration. Frustration. Negative energy against somebody. Okay, negative energy. Irritable. Okay, irritable. Um, frustrated. Frustrated. Annoyed. Annoyed. I'd say steamy. That's mm -hmm. a good one. I can see the steam coming out of your ears right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm picturing like Tom and Jerry right now. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Now, another one, what are things that you get angry about, but I want to qualify it as like, maybe a little bit more like, what are things that you think like we as a society should be angry about? And man, I think we have an easy example, like in light of the horrific shooting yesterday at the elementary school, right? That 18, 18 children and, and two teachers, I think the death toll is like up to 21 right now, senseless shooting <coughs> because of the lack of, of gun control, right? I mean, to me, that is, that's something for us to be angry about as a society. What are things as like a society we should be angry about. People treat people. Okay, how people treat people. Justice. Injustices. Ignorance. Okay, ignorance. Being fair. Sorry, say it again. Being fair. Right? Oh, being fair, right? So when things aren't fair. No. I'd say like when we see abuse. Mm -hmm. Non-acceptance. Okay, non-acceptance, so discrimination. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. The prejudice. Okay. The prejudice. All the hidden political agendas. All, all the what? Sorry, say again. The hidden political. Okay. The twists and. Yeah. So, so maybe like. The lack, of, the, the lack of integrity of like the politician. Yeah. All right. The back doors. Back doors. It's a good one. All right. I would ask, like, what are the things like we get angry about? But like, I want to stay away from like maybe the individual nuances of like what gets us angry. And so that's why I wanted to focus on like what things that we see around us like should anger us right and we listed a lot of them. now what do you think 
or what do you see this is my last question and i hope it makes sense <laughs> but like <laughs> what do you see anger as an expression of like when you get angry like we listed a lot of things right of like what things should we as a society be angry about what is anger an actual expression of Actually, I think it's helplessness. One, one second, T. Somebody. It's actual expression of rejection of something, and I want to change it. That's why. And if I am not able to change it, so I'm angry. Uh, I have energy to change something okay. that I'm not satisfying of. Okay. And so it's I an expression of wanting to correct something that is wrong. Yes. Okay. And, and so you're kind of like gearing yourself up and gaining that energy to correct like a wrong. That, that's something that's like, clearly wrong, okay? Good. T, you were gonna say something? Yeah, to add to that, um, a helplessness because you're yeah. you're so angry, you wanna be able to change things and you can't sometimes because it's too big a thing. Okay, so anger as an expression of our limitation. Correct. Okay. Um, anger is an expression of grief. Okay. Like just, I, you know, in addition to wanting to change things and feeling like helplessness, I feel grief that I can't change them. So I may, it may be easier to just experience anger rather than the, you know, the, the weight of the grief. It's also strength. Okay. So anger is an expression of strength. Right, these are good. Sorry, last, last one, go ahead. Can we say, yeah. like, if I'm angry regarding um, unfair situation, can I say that's the Holy Spirit's voice in me? Very well, could be. All right, so an anger as an expression of, like, of an injustice, right? And a lot of the things that we said, like, we get angry as a society towards injustices, mm -hmm. right? And so it's, it's you know, natural to be angry as an expression of like i don't like this injustice okay well, all right i don't know if that could be something i don't know sometimes i get confused if it's uh um, always gentle when angry about it just i don't know if it's me or that's god's voice in me mm, that's a good one i don't know that like I think that's something like you'd have to, you know, sit with maybe like a spiritual mentor to kind of tease that out. Um, Cause I don't, I, I don't know of like a way of just saying like, well, this is when it's the Holy spirit and this is when it's not. Right. But yes, the Holy spirit is gentle, but also God like gets angry. Right. And that's what we're going to unpack. So, so hold on to that. And hopefully we will make some sense of it today. All right. So when we look at this attribute of God of being slow to anger, has a, the, the Hebrew word of it is erek apayim. Okay. Erek apayim. I would give anybody $200 if you could translate this. One, right. Because you know what the translation of this one is? Long nose. Okay, long of nose. That's what the translation of slow to anger in Hebrew, we like Shakespeare. Translate translate it. Long of nose. All right, erek, <laughs> and up is nose. Okay, so slow or long, and then nose. And it's interesting because, like, okay, why are we describing being slow to anger as being long of nose? Right, especially when we talk about God. Who is spirit? So there's no nose on God, right? So that's why I asked everybody, what are different ways you could describe somebody as being angry? And we said like, you know, I said steamy or like different people said irritated and we said like red or hot, right? Those are different ways that we can describe somebody as being angry. So in the Hebrew, <laughs> They describe 
somebody who is slow to anger as being long of nose. <laughs> when you think about like somebody who's angry, you would say like their face gets red, they get, they get hot. So we have similar ways of describing anger. When you think of like somebody gets you know hot really, really quick, like their whole nose face gets, their nose gets red and their whole face gets red because they're angry. Somebody who's going to be slow to anger is going to have a long nose. Anger is going to start at the tip, but it's not necessarily going to make it all the way to the head. Because when you get to the head, that's when we act, right? And so this idea of God being slow to anger is, is a way of saying, like, God is of long nose. <laughs> He gets irritated, and the tip of his nose may get red, but it takes a long time for that anger to really get to, like, the head, if you will, in which point there's an action, right? Never thought that we'd be talking about slow to anger and equivalenting, you know, saying that it's a long nose. But here, let's look at some, some scripture. So we're going to look at Genesis thirty nine nineteen. okay? 3919. Oh, sorry, the, the slides didn't turn out the way that I'd hope. Um, but anyway, give you an example. When Joseph was in the house of Potiphar, and his wife made the accusation that Joseph tried to uh, you know, molest her or abuse her, and it was a lie. She told her husband, and 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 what we have here in 39. 19 is his response and his response okay is now when his master heard the words of his wife which she spoke to him saying this is what your slave did to me his anger or his um app burned okay or his nose burned is what they're like what's being conveyed like if you were to read the, the hebrew it would say his nose burned all right so we, we see this is how, like in, in the Hebrew language, this is how they were describing somebody who's angry, right? They're burning, they're hot, right? Give you another one, Exodus 4, 14. And Exodus 4 is when, you know, the Lord is talking to Moses and he's kind of frustrated with Moses, who's kind of dragging his feet of going to Pharaoh. And, and so we, we have this exchange between God and Moses where he says, then the anger or the the app of the Lord or the nose of the Lord burned against Moses. And he said, is there not your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently and moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Right. So he's saying, I'm going to give you Aaron to help you to go approach Pharaoh. But we, we get this expression of the, the anger or the, the nose or the, the, the redness of God. Is, is birth, right? So, so we have these, you know, few descriptive words that give us a sense of like anger, right? Make sense? So to say that somebody is slow to anger is saying they got a long nose and it's take a long time for that redness to really hit the, the face, okay? To elicit a response. Now let's look at any questions. Can be totally lost about long nose, long of being long of nose, right? <laughs> All right, God, and let's look. So clearly, there's many passages in Scripture that talk about God's anger, right? And it's recorded often. We hear God was angry about this, and He did this, and God was angry over here, and, and and so on. And some people can get the impression that He's an angry God by the number of times that the anger is is you know mentioned in association with God. Right. And so you can draw a quick conclusion that he's an angry God, but it's an un, it's an inaccurate conclusion because God himself is describing himself as being slow to anger. It's one of his attributes. And, the, and, and what we're, we've been saying about Exodus 34, 6 is that this is God describing himself. He's not leaving it up to anybody else to tell us like who we think he is. He's saying, this is who I am. So he's saying, I'm slow to anger, all right? Or I have a long nose. So what are the situations, the questions that we have to ask are, what are the situations 
that anger God, right? And those are the situations that we need to look at. And by far and away, when we look at the Old Testament, what really angers God are social injustices. Mm -hmm. He really is upset and angered at social injustices. Because when we look at all the prophets of the Old Testament, right, they, you know, came at a time where the kings were getting worse and worse as time went on. And those in power were manipulating their power. And, and as a result, the, the people who were under the kings and the rulers and the governors and stuff, they were suffering because of all these social injustices that were happening. And so all the prophets said, turn from your ways. Stop being unjust to one another. Stop being unrighteous to one another. Stop treating each other so poorly because you need to repent. And if you choose not to repent, punishment is coming, right? So it's turn from your ways. If you don't turn from, turn from your ways, punishment is coming. And then the last part of all the prophets, they said, even though you're going to get punished because you refuse to turn from your ways and repent, don't worry, hope is coming at the end because Christ is coming, right? So that's what the you know, basic threefold message of all the prophets. And it was so much gathered, like geared towards and focused on all these social injustices that were happening. All right? So let's look. Let's go to Isaiah 5. Isaiah chapter 5. We're going to look at uh, 5 through 7. Somebody has it. You can go ahead and read it. And, and I'll give a little preference. So this is like. So Isaiah 5 through 7, chapter 5, 5 through 7. And, and, and these selection of verses, you know, the Lord is talking to Isaiah. And he's saying like, he's saying like, okay, because of all these injustices, I'm going to come in and I'm going to punish my own. Right. And so he's giving a, a picture of what he's going to do as a result of the way his people are behaving, the way the Israelites, you know, and, and, and Judah are, are behaving. And so he likens it to like a vineyard. And, and he is the one who owns the vineyard. And we've seen this picture before in the New Testament. So somebody read Isaiah 5, verses 5 through 7. So now so let, let me tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain no more, and it rain, to rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah has his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed for righteousness. But behold, a cry, a cry of distress. Right? So this is like, this says like, what's fueling it? And he summarizes at the end. I looked for justice, and I found the opposite. Right? I was looking for kindness, but all I heard was cries from one another. Right? And now, like, my vineyard, it's time to teach a lesson. Right? And Isaiah was one of the prophets who came towards the end of, of the line of kings. So he, he was kind of preaching at the end, and it was getting really bad. And kind of the exile was, was around the corner. And, and so, you know, to, to give just more like credence to this idea of what angers God, we're going to go and jump to verses uh, 20, Ch Isaiah chapter 5. We'll, we'll jump to verse 20, right? Because he continues to articulate like what, what is bothering him so much and why he's taking a get, an action against his his own people. Um, does anybody have Isaiah 5? We're going to look at uh, verse 20, and we're actually going to read through 25. For to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight, 
water a man mighty at drinking wine, water a man valiant for mixing intoxicating drink, to justify the wicked for a bribe and take away his justice for the righteous man. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble, devours the stubble, and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be rottenness, and their blossom will ascend like dust, because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. Sorry, I'm going to pause you just because the anger of the Lord, the app, okay, of the Lord has burned against his people. Go ahead. He has stretched out his hands against them and stricken them, and the hills trembled. Their carcasses were as refuse in the midst of the street. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Okay, awesome. So we see, like, he's looking at what's happening, and it's just like, I can't take it anymore, right? And, and, and this is clearly a, is not an overnight process. Like, we don't have nations go from, like, being under David and Solomon, like, flip to this overnight. Happens over time, right? And it gets worse and worse. And, and it's, he's, like, so annoyed. He's, like, who justified the wicked for a bribe. So, like, even, like, or bad, like, as long as you just pay off somebody, like, you're going to go free. The justice is so deep in there. And, and God is saying, like, no more. Okay, I've used up all my notes. <laughs> right? So now he's act. What is God's an expression of? Justice. Or the lack thereof, right? Right? So it, it's an expression. Sorry, you're, you're correct. It's not a lack thereof. His anger is an expression of justice. Because he's looking at the situation and saying, no more. Right? And he's also looking at the people and saying, I love these people. Like, no more can this continue to happen. I'm going to act. Right? Could we say that God was loving and compassionate if there was no or never any action against the injustices. Could we say that God was loving and compassionate if he never acted against the injustices? No. He can't. Right? And so... His expression of anger is towards the injustice, but it's also an expression of his loving kindness. Right? He's saying like, enough. St. John Chrysostom comments on this, right? So I have the, the, the quote up for people uh, online and I'll, I'll read it out loud. It says, for if the wrath of God were a passion, one might well despair as being unable to quench the flame which he, a wicked man, has kindled by so, by so many evil doings, right? So, so what he's saying here is like, you know, for if the wrath of God were, were passionate, if he was just like acting emotionally, right, then there's, there's no way to like quench that, right? He's just like enraged. But... His divine nature isn't driven by emotion. It's driven by like his essence, his attributes, right? He is loving and he is compassionate. He is justice and, and like he is merciful. So it's, it's like all of these are what fuel his actions, right? But since the divine nature is passionless, okay, and he's using it in the negative sense, Right? Even if he punishes, even if he takes vengeance, he does this not with wrath, right? not just out of anger, but with the tender care and much loving kindness. Wherefore, it behooves us to be of much good courage and to trust in the power of repentance. Right? So he's doing it. When he acts, it's because he sees the injustices and doesn't want to just revenge. He wants to turn. Right? He wants to... Like, Say enough of this, like we have to act in, in a new way. 
And in order to do that, yes, like he's got to come in and change the situation and act and, and, and act in a very strong way. But he's doing it because he wants to fuel justice. He wants to fuel and, and set us in the right direction. Right. And so repentance becomes a really important part, like or, or, or important thing to keep in mind when we talk about God's anger. Right. Because how does he describe himself? Slow to anger. Why? Because he's building in that space for repentance. Right? He's building in that space for repentance. Let's look at some examples. We're going to look at one from like a bird's eye view, and then we're going to hone in on one in scripture. So example is when we look at the Exodus and Pharaoh. Right? So he sent Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh. And he's saying, let my people go. And we go through kind of this whole discussion between Pharaoh and, and Moses. And, and with each plague, it gets harder and harder. And, and if, if Pharaoh would just concede and say, okay, I'm letting your people go, then we wouldn't have gotten to the 10th plague. Because what was it? Like, let my people go. Okay, no. Here are frogs. Let my people go. No. Lice, let my people go. No. So it's like everyone got harder and harder. Right. Why not just go to like, okay, I'm going to kill your firstborn. Because he's slow to anger. Right? He's waiting. He's giving opportunity and saying, okay, turn. Turn to me. But even after the 10th plague, where, where the firstborn of Pharaoh and everybody in Egypt was, was, you know, died, Pharaoh still couldn't humble himself, right? And what did he want? What did, what does scripture say? Like, how did I lose my mind? I let all our workers go. So he wants to bring them back to re-enslave them. He wants injustice again. And so he chases them into the Red Sea and, and, you know, Moses splits the Red Sea by God's power. The people of Israel um, escape. And then Pharaoh, as they're chasing after them, gets swallowed up by the Red Sea again, right? But God, did he express anger? Yes. But it was slow. There are a lot of opportunities. Okay? He is slow to anger. It took a long time for that red at the tip of the nose to, like, get all the way to the, the head. All right? Let's look at another one. Let's look at Jonah, Jonah and Nineveh in chapter three, All right? Jonah chapter three. And, and so when we look at the book of Jonah, Jonah is a prophet who is unique because um, he was sent to non-Israelites, you know, a, a nation that was not considered God's people. Nineveh was, was just like a separate nation. Mm -hmm. And, even though it wasn't God's people, God still cared about them, right? And, and we see that captured in, in, in the story of Jonah. And Jonah goes, you know, after we kind of get through the whole story of, of the, being in the, the belly of the fish for three days, he eventually makes it to the city of Nineveh. And he starts to proclaim and says, okay, in 40 days, Nineveh is going to be flipped upside down, right? The wrath of God is coming. And, and his word eventually, like, you know, permeates throughout, you know, the different levels and the ranks of the city and makes it to the king and the king hears it. And then the king responds, all right? Let's read the king's response in chapter uh, three, verses seven and nine. He issued a proclamation and it said in Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And let men call on God earnestly, that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. All right, right. So, so this is the response of the king. He's like, I don't know who this God is, but he sounds powerful. Let's stop, right? And so there's this period of time where they are, are, are 
you know, it's not like Jonah came in and said, oh, you guys are toast. Here comes the wrath of God. No, he preached a message and there was a turn. There was a turning from the injustice. And, and Nineveh historically was known as a really brutal city, right? They were ruthless to each other. Um, and, and so this was God reaching out to them and saying like, okay, stop this. Your injustices, like have, I, I see it and I've heard the cries and I want you to stop, right? And, and in verse 10, it says, when God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked ways, then God relented concerning the calamity, which he had declared he would bring upon them. And he did not do it, right? But here's the part that I want us to think about is that Nineveh turned now. But Nineveh went back to their old ways, right? So we actually have two prophets that went and prophesied in Nineveh. And hundreds of years later, okay, maybe not hundred year, hundreds of years, but, you know, I think about a hundred years, all right? Nahum, the prophet, prophesied to Nineveh. But by this time, like Nineveh had forgotten, turned back to their injustices, and despite, like, all the warnings, turned. And what we have in, in Nahum, the prophet, is look, look at Nahum chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. Right? So even though, like, they repented and God relented, they turned back to their ways, but God is patient, waiting and waiting and waiting. But when there is no, when he sees that they're, like, they're not turning, then there is punishment, right? Because he is still a God of justice. So there's still that element that has to be executed, right? And that's how we know he's a God of justice, because while he was, while he is slow to anger, he won't let the guilty go unpunished. There is going to be justice. And we, and we see it there. And God alone is able to carry out this balance between anger and compassion and justice. Right? Sometimes it's hard for us to say, like, how can you be angry? And how can you show compassion? And how can you show justice all at the same time? Sometimes they seem like contradictory to us in our minds. But with God, like... He's the only one who's able to, like, be merciful, be slow to anger, but bring justice in the right time and in the right way, right? That's what makes him God, is he's able to kind of hold this balance, the, this tension together of all these attributes. And when he acts, he acts justly and mercifully. Even when he brings justice, like, it seems harsh, but it's actually an act of mercy because Without it, how would they turn? Right? So it's kind of the confluence of all of this. And, and I think Isaiah and, and many of the prophets, but Isaiah said it plenty of times in, in throughout, throughout the book of Isaiah, where he says, in spite of all this, his anger does not turn away and his hand is still stretched out. Right? So we see that, that kind of the two. Turn, 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 turn. Okay, you're not going to turn. Anger, okay, but anger with the intention of turning. But my hand is always there. I'm going to help you through the punishment I'm going to give you. And we see that. We see that like 40 years in the wilderness, he sustained. He was angry. He wanted them to correct, but he still provided for them. Right? So we see this like, Two, two arms like coming from God. Like, I'm going to punish you because you're just not learning. And I've been patient, but you need to learn, but I'm going to help you through it. Okay? So slow to anger. Now let's kind of like, any questions so far? Okay? Let's look at God's anger in the New Testament. All right? And we're going to look at, we're going to spend some time in, in Romans chapter 1. Um, we look at like God's anger, okay? Or, you know, St. Paul speaks about his, his wrath or, or anger upon unrighteousness and ungodliness, right? 
And it's interesting, like how St. Paul, you know, describes how God responds to these unrighteous acts of human uh, of humanity, right? So we see a, a, a not a God doesn't change, but how He executes His His anger like matures as we mature, so to speak. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at Romans chapter 1, and we're going to read, yes, verses uh, 18, and we're eventually going to get through 24, okay? Anybody read verses 18 through 24, Romans chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are, are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. So uh, I'll pause you there. So, so what he's saying, just to make sure we're all on the same page, like saying, okay, the wrath of God is going to be revealed against ungodliness and unrighteousness because God has revealed himself. He has made himself, like we can, we can observe everything around us and through the things that like we, the physical world around us and through kind of history and all of all, all these events and, and this revelation of God, we as humans, can see him, right? We can understand him. We can know his presence and know about him through his interaction with us. But despite knowing him, we ch still choose ungodliness. So St. Paul saying like the evidence is unmistakable. We can see the hand of God and we can understand him for everything, right? But yet these individuals, okay, are still committing unrighteousness. So continue at verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Oh, thank you. So how do we see his anger? Like, how do we see this idea of like slow to anger in these verses? Uh, I see it coupled with a desire for his children to come back to him. Okay, where uh, I agree. Where do you see that? Or, or how do you see that? Well, it, it, generally with the nation of Israel, his beloved, he always wanted his adult wife, if you will, to come back to him. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they strayed. They, they needed to... to uh, forget the, the idols that they made and the, the concept about God that they had and come back to him as revealed by his prophets and, uh, and, and everyone. Okay. He gave them freedom to make their own choices. Okay. Um, like he didn't, he, he, it's like he, he didn't like um, punish them directly. Okay. He just was basically like, okay, I'm going to let you, I'm just going to let you do what you want. Okay. Yeah. And, and, he, and he also said that, look, Israel, if you're not going to follow me, we got the Gentiles over here too, you know? Okay. All right. Enough people would come in if, if you're not uh, me. All right. You ready to say, Melania? So, uh... Like verses 20, they are without excuse because he 
have seen them and okay. his attributes. Mm -hmm. So you've seen them. So, so they know of him, yeah. right? They know God. And, and by saying they know God, they know what's right in him, right? right? Because he is absolute goodness and everything like apart from him, not, <laughs> right? So they know that good and, and that evil, but yet they're just insistent. He's like, even though you have all the evidence, right? And, and it has been like, again, this evidence and this revelation of God is over time, but yet they still don't want to, right? So he gives them over. Why is he giving them over? He's saying like, I turn them over to, or, or, or how does he say it? Like, therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity. Like, how is that his anger? How is that what? Like, how is that his anger? Like, hmm. so I think God sometimes, like, he, he, like, there are laws that are set, okay. and he allows things to happen naturally. Okay. And like, this is truth, this is justice. Follow truth, follow justice, and you'll find it. Right? Okay. If you don't follow truth, you don't follow justice, naturally, you will be given up to your lusts and desires. So it's just like almost like a natural law where if you're not, um, when you're not seeking God, although you know God, mm -hmm. then you naturally stray away and, and allow other things to become your God. Okay. And what happens to us when we do that? Like, what do we experience when we stray away? Trouble. We Falling. suffer the consequences of our actions. We suffer the consequences of our actions, right? The decisions that we make. Falling into folly. Sorry? Falling into folly. We fall falling into folly like we suffer right and and it almost becomes the best teacher right it's like you know see somebody who's like young and like you know crass and just like full of themselves and you're looking you're like man if you don't change your ways you're gonna pay for it right and you can sit down you can talk to them say like look in my experience if you go down this route, it's not going to fare well. And you can sit down, you can have like a lot of conversations. This is like parenting is all about this. If you continue down this road, like it's not going to be good. And like kids can be resistant to that. And as a parent, like sometimes you just have to be like, okay, like go and experience the, like the trouble of your decisions. Yeah. Right. And we, and we allow that to happen. Because life has this beautiful way of just teaching us the lessons, right? And, and we allow, like, our loved ones to experience, you know, that conflict and that turmoil and that challenge and, and just kind of having life smack them upside the head. Why? Because we hope that when it happens, they turn, right? Why doesn't God come and say, nope, I'm not going to let you do this? Because we have the free will. Okay, we have the free will. And, and if he violates that free will, what cannot happen? Or what can we not have with him? We don't have a relationship with him. Okay. We can't have a relationship, and, and even more specifically, we can't have a love relationship with him because you know it needs to be for it to be love, it's got to be free. The other thing is that I think what's confusing, Abuna. Sure. Sorry, I don't want to interject here, but it's just on point. Is that sometimes like God does prevent me from doing things. Like he's not going to ultimately prevent me, but there are things like, 
you know, that I, I do make attempts to escape from one direction or another, and he does prevent it. Mm. Um, and then later on, I see, you know, I can see the reason why he did that. So I think, I mean, I think there's kind of like multiple things at play. One is like, we don't have the power necessarily to prevent our loved ones from like, we cannot control them. We know God could do that. He chooses sometimes to do it and sometimes he doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I think that's can be confusing a little bit. Like, um, it is confusing. And, yeah, and, that and can be just, confusing. <laughs> and, and that's a product of, of like God's wisdom and, and, and his n- deep, intimate knowledge of each one of us. It's just like, you know, as, as a parent, you look at your kids and like sometimes you do step in and sometimes you don't, right? What gives you kind of that knowledge to know when to step in and when not is like your life experience and your deep knowledge and understanding of your child, right? As a parent, like we can only do that for soul. You know, God towards us, he can do it our entire lives. But the point is that like, he has a very, very intimate knowledge of who we are and he knows us better than ourselves. And so he knows how to navigate that with us. Yes, sometimes he saves us from mistakes, but at the same time, like when he really wants us to learn, sometimes he'll let us make the mistakes, especially when we're so resistant, right? And we experience it. And when we experience kind of like the consequences of our decisions, What's the most common thing that people say? God is angry at me. Right? He's angry at me. He's punishing me. We did it to ourselves. Right? Sometimes he does. Okay? He sees us as his children. We are sons and daughters, and he will chastise us. Okay? And scripture says that. But there are times where he just lets us, you know, deal with the consequences of our own decisions. And sometimes, and frequently, we turn and say, like, God is punishing me, or God is angry at me, right? Why in this verse, I feel that we already passed the, I mean, we are, we are over the, um, the anger. I feel that this is like the consequences, not, not the anger stage. It, you're, you're right there. Like, it, he's not addressing anger like directly in these verses yeah right but when we but what this what these verses capture is this like ongoing resistance towards god and and that ongoing resistance towards god is uh manifested through unrighteous acts or ungodly acts which is what saint paul in these verses is describing and what we you know meditated on at the beginning was that God's expression of anger is in response to like injustices and in response to ungodly behavior. So we see like kind of the same elements that that we're meditating on in the Old Testament here in in these collection of verses, right? And and really what all this is, you know, what what we're gearing towards is that he allows you know, he's slow, he's patient, he wants us to see him, and all the evidence is there for us to see him. But when we don't want to, right, he's going to give us over to our desires, and we're going to pay the consequences. But he's doing that, right, in hopes that we would turn. So we see again, that element, why does he do it? Because he wants us to turn. Why did we see him like, do what he did in the Old Testament? Because he wants his people to turn. Right? There's an experience of hardship in both, but the experience of hardship is, is fueled by the desire to not leave us where we are. Mm. He wants us to change. And so in order to get us to go, he wants us to experience hardship. You know, sometimes he may bring it upon us. Sometimes we may experience it. it, like it sometimes it's really hard to decipher. But the key elements that we're seeing in this idea of God being slow to anger is that he's coming after us. He wants us. Right. But he's not going to let the injustices and the wrongdoings go undealt with. 
So we will deal with the consequences in hopes that we come back. All right. And, and the last verse I want to share is, is St. Paul in, in 1 Corinthians. He's saying, He's saying, but when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world, right? So he's saying, like, we get disciplined by him, right? We get punished by him because he wants to save us from the ultimate condemnation, right? Where, where there is no turning back. So he's going to be patient with us and, and use the entirety of our lives in order, you know, to allow us to experience hardship in order to come back, right? So he's slow. He's patient. Right. And even when we're resistant, he is patient. Why? Because he wants us to come back. Does that make sense, Peter? Yes, Abuna. Thank you so much. Hmm? Abuna. Yeah. Um, just to uh, rewind just a little bit. Yeah. Where, um, she was saying that, that talking about being blocked. Um, what do you mean being blocked? When uh hodge monkeys, I'm forgetting names. Um like see being being blocked as she's moving forward trying to get to a certain path. And oh, like like God sometimes stops us from certain like actions. Right. Right. Okay. And those blocks are to me seem more like a gui guidance, like you're, you're going the wrong way. I'm going to put this block in front of you, hoping that you'll go left instead of right. Yeah. And I'll give you a few chances to do that. Absolutely. He does. He tries to guide us. He tries to save us from party. But if we can't learn the lessons of the block, eventually he's going to say like, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, I'm going to give you so many chances, like three strikes, then you're out. <laughs> One of those. Yeah. It, oh. Like he's patient, but ultimately like, mm -hmm. It would be unloving for him to just leave us in, in the situation we're in. But because he's loving, because he's compassionate, he doesn't want us to stay in the situation. And so he allows us to experience the hardship so that we, we turn and change our lives, right? Which is why repentance is such an important part, right? It's beautifully like kind of linked in to this idea of God being slow to anger. Slow, 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 opportunity to repent. Slow, 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 opportunity to repent. Okay, you don't want to repent. Boom. Right? That's because he loves us. Any thoughts or questions? I want to have a question, please. So um, God in the Old Testament was, uh, was Noah uh, and the rain was Sodom and was Pharaoh, it was very harsh. Uh, and after the New Testament, we find God uh, is less harsh. Does his nose get bigger now? or like... <laughs> <laughs> No. It, like, I like so, that. I know. <laughs> so, so when we talk about the God is God. He does not change in Old Testament. He does not change in New Testament. He is consistent throughout. Right. The love and compassion that he had in the old is the same love and compassion that um, he has in the new. So we can't think that there's any difference between old and new. Right. But what we have is this maturation of our relationship with him. OK. We have social context changing over time. And God always contextualizes his love for us. Right. So what he did and what he allowed back then is different than what he allows now. Is there hardness of heart back then so that he allowed certain things? Yes. He doesn't allow them now. Why? Because social context changed. He didn't change. We change. We evolve. But he is constantly trying to show us love, mercy, compassion, justice. So he's always going to do it like in different ways. Why did he speak in parables? It made sense to the people then. But in the parables are timeless truths. They're eternal truths that matter then and matter now. We just have to contextualize it for now, right? So we can't go down that rabbit hole of God changed. How he dealt with this, matured, and also he was working towards the coming of his son. And, 
in the coming of his son and after we, we experienced his incarnation, his death, his resurrection, like, again, our relationship, like, changed and matured. So there's a different way of, of like, not a different way, but, like, yeah, a different way of, of how we understand our relationship with him. So, yes, he did things, like, differently then, but it's not because he was changing. It's because we are changing. Thank you, Abun. Mm-hmm.